please welcome from CMS, Dr. Michelle Schreiber, and from NCQA, Frank Michike. Well, hello everyone. Uh, we are thrilled to see you uh, and that um, folks stuck around for this. I think you'll be glad you did because we have with us um, one of the premier uh, people in quality in the entire country. Um, let me introduce Michelle. Uh, first, I'm Frank Michke. I am our Vice President of Public Policy and External Relations at NCQA. In that role, I get to interact a lot with CMS and have over the 10 years I've been there. And I have to say the last two years in particular have been the most productive and I think effective uh, as far as working together and um, aiming toward and achieving some shared goals with CMS. So I am honored to be joined by Dr. Michelle Schreiber. <clears throat> Excuse me. She is the Deputy Director for the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality at CMS. Prior to that role, she was in a number of senior roles at the Henry Ford Medical System, in Health System, excuse me, in Detroit, including, very relevant to our work, Chief Quality Officer, and also very relevant to our work and a lot of the themes that we've talked about today. She was the Senior Vice President of Clinical Transformation and IT Integration, and I understand you oversaw the EPIC, the conversion to EPIC, so I'm sure. And won a Davies Award for that, by the way. Very I'm nice. I'm proud of that. Congratulations. Um, she's also a general internal medicine physician. We were just discussing that she's had to step away from that in the last couple of years, um, but uh, she's very grounded in, in that service and that um, work in the community with her patients. And tidbit that I just got backstage, living in Michigan, She's a big Ohio State fan. So, uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. So, you know, she, she's, she, you know she's tough if she's a Buckeye in the middle of, you're right near the, the university. So, um, it's really great to have Michelle here. Michelle, if you'll indulge me for a minute, I'd like to open up with some notes of gratitude. The first um, is to our staff at NCQA for all of the work that's gone into making this what I think was a wonderful three days. Um, yeah, really. Starting with Akina Better, who is our uh, director of events, uh, her team, uh, as well as our marketing colleagues, our colleagues in education and corporate and foundation relations, to name just a few of the, of the major departments that have played a role, but um, it has been such, a, uh, such an effort and such a successful effort, and it's just, um, every year we do this, it kind of reinvigorates, I know me, and hopefully you all, um, around our mission. So thank you to the staff. Um, the second piece of gratitude is to those of you who stayed around, and not only stayed around, you stayed around to the absolute end of the conference, and, you still could be at the pool if you wanted to be, and you're not. So we are, I, I know, speaking for Michelle, we are very grateful. We expected a much smaller uh, fireside chat. I said to Michelle, uh, who knew that our fireside chat would actually fit in a fireside? Uh, and as it turns out, it wouldn't. So thank you. We really appreciate your coming. Um, and then the final uh, note of gratitude is to Michelle and CMS, because as I said, um, we have had such a productive and effective um, and communal relationship um, within the bounds uh, <laughs> that you all are allowed to do, um, uh, advancing a couple of major uh, priorities in particular, and that would be digital transformation and quality, and then health equity. And I've never seen an administration of uh, uh, HHS that was um, as committed to any priority as this one is to equity. Uh, it truly is baked into everything you all do. I know it's the first consideration, and it's, um, I've been really impressed with your commitment and your follow through on that. So thank you, Michelle, as an individual, CMS as an organization. It's been a, a wonderful time to be working together. So now we'll get the, the hard balls, the fast balls here, Michelle. Um, let's see. So uh, the Universal Foundation. Um, we were absolutely thrilled to read the article uh, this spring uh, in JAMA that you and several uh, other leaders at CMS wrote. Um, we were even more excited that uh, many of those measures were overlapped with our HEDA data set. Um, 
I want to I want to ask you as you go around as you talk to folks what are you hearing about the Universal Foundation from the people who have to um, are, are on the front lines of reporting and measuring quality and what should we expect next well first of all I want to say a few thank yous if I may as well to all of you who stayed really thank you we do appreciate it so much and to NCQA, this has been a great conference. So congratulations to those of you who put this together. Really, congratulations. Um, it's, it's our pleasure, really, to, to work in collaboration with, uh, with you. The Universal Foundation was actually put together as a guidepost for CMS, for us within our organization, to make sure that we were always aligning measures between Medicare, Medicaid, the marketplace, the fee-for-service programs, the MA programs, because we realized that, frankly, we were contributing to some of the burden of quality measures by not having measures that were aligned across our programs. But that's just a start, and so we use that across CMS. We're also working very closely with our federal partners. That includes the VA, CDC, AHRQ, to try and align measures across federal programs and really align our strategies even around measure development. And finally, as you know, through the um, CQMC, the Core Measure of, um, Quality Collaborative, to try and align measures across all payers because we recognize that there is burden to reporting. It's important to report. It's fundamentally important to report. But there is burden, and we need to be reducing that burden. And I'll give you an example of why. As Chief Quality Officer of the Henry Ford Health System, I had on my wall a spreadsheet of 650 measures that our system had to report. Because you report to the federal government, you report to commercial payers, you report for ratings agencies, you report for various quality initiatives. That's a lot of work. And so aligning as much as we can, we think, is, is important. This year in rule writing, you probably saw we are really trying to standardize our measures. And the Universal Foundation actually is just measures for adult and pediatric ambulatory care. What you can look forward to is other sets of measures, Universal Foundation for hospitals, for example, for post-acute care, and aligning those across the care journey as much as we can. And finally, for specialty measures, we view the new MIPS value pathways as specialty foundational measures. So we're really trying very hard to align measures. And NCQA has been an essential part of that uh, journey. As you noted, many of the measures in the Universal Foundation are indeed NCQA measures in recognition of, one, the very good work that is done in developing those measures, and two, how important they are, especially in the payer community. So hopefully you will see more alignment, more alignment in our rules, and more alignment across all payers. As you mentioned, um, you all have been at it for quite a while trying to get to this collaboration, the, the uh, quality collaborative, the measure collaborative, I know, um, has been several years now. I'm sure that informs some of the Universal Foundation work. Um, if, if you had one thing, your magic wand you could wave that prevents the kind of uh, alignment that we all agree is needed, what might that be? Hmm. You didn't give me that question. I didn't, advance. and I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, honestly, I think a lot of it is willpower. Yeah. There is nothing that prevents most of us from being in alignment and from developing a universal foundation of measures for the country. Other countries have done this, and so we can too. But there are a lot of different agendas and a lot of different interests and a lot of, uh, quite honestly, people who really want to look good on their dashboard and mm -hmm. want to change measures to make that happen. But we need to recognize that, number one, in order to really have data that you can compare, you know, you can compare blood pressure control in one location with another because you need standardized data elements and standardized definitions. In order to do that, we probably really do need more and more alignment, because otherwise we can't even compare our data, let alone have interoperable data. 
That was an excellent off-the-cuff answer. Apologize for the <laughs> un or, uh, unanticipated question. Um, and I may have inadvertently segued to my next question, which I there you we go. have discussed. <laughs> um, so as you were saying that, um, what came to my mind, because it's what's on a lot of our minds at NCQA, among other priorities, is, is digital. And the, I guess the question linking those two together would be, how do you believe the Universal Foundation might help advance the move to digital? You know, I recognize that many of the measures in the Universal Foundation aren't necessarily digital and aren't ECQMs, but putting them on a Universal Foundation actually elevates them to being some of the first ones that we're going to try and really move to a digital space. At some point in time, and this is true not only of CMS, but everybody who uses measures, we will all get to a point where we will only use measures that are digital or digitally sourced. We will only use measures that are written in fire specifications. I can't tell you when that day is. We talk about that at CMS frequently, but that will happen. And those measures then will be those that are pervasive throughout the universal uh, core set of measures. I will say that on CMS's measures under consideration list, you know, the measures that go through the process of vetting and get recommended to CMS for use in our programs, they are 88% digitally sourced. And so we really think we've made a lot of progress. That's great. That's exact. That's how it happens, right? You, you mm -hmm. telegraph a little bit. You, that's where that list is so valuable. Just, you just keep yeah. going with yeah. it. Yeah, willpower. <laughs> so great. Um, along those same lines as far as digital, I know CMS and yourself, you pride yourselves on getting out there and talking to all the stakeholders about um, anything you're looking to do or their experiences, whether it's the patients or the, the managed care plans or the uh, providers. So um, I assume at some point in those conversations, the question of the transition to digital quality measurement comes up. You're laughing already, so. <laughs> Uh, what are you hearing that you can say, you know, uh, non-profanity? Uh, <laughs> what are you hearing from the community? Because I will say this, uh, we hear a lot as well, as you would imagine, because we are um, pushing forward. Um, and it's extremely valuable, as I'm sure it is to you. Um, so there's nothing wrong with people getting angry about it, right? As long as they're part of a constructive solution, or at least they can see their way to one. Well, I was going to say the first thing that we hear, quite honestly, is fear and loathing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and we recognize the reasons for some of that. Number one, it's work to do the conversion to digital. Number two, it does require some infrastructure development. It's change. People don't always like change, no matter what. Clinicians really don't trust electronic medical records. They don't like them. They don't like the pajama time that they have to dedicate to. And, and I know because I've done that myself. Um, they feel like data entry clerks, perhaps, as opposed to clinicians. And that has to change and I think is slowly changing. But we have to overcome that trust and that fear and that dislike, actually, of electronic medical records. And I think we will. Because as we continue to talk about the transition to digital measures, it's really the transition to interoperability. Digital measures are really but a use case for shared data interoperability. And as we start talking about that journey and what it looks like at the end, people become excited. I think everybody can understand this vision of the digital transformation of healthcare, which has happened in so many other industries. Where that can go in the future, including monitoring at home, care that is outside normal geographic boundaries, information that you can get in near real time to be making real decisions, to have clinical decision support tools based on data, data that you can trust patients being able to get their information and understand it to make informed care decisions. Everybody sees that important journey going forward. I think people are looking for a roadmap. I think people are looking for the commitment that if, if they start down this journey, it will have been worth their investment. But there's plenty of data now that shows once over the initial investment, it's much cheaper to actually use and run digital measures. 
And it has so many advantages, including the ability to layer on machine learning and advanced uh, artificial intelligence tools to be able to do some of the other things that we just spoke about, you know, real-time measures, um, the availability of, of data. It, there is no other valid solution other than to drive forward towards interoperable digital data. And again, digital measures are just a really good use case to help get us there. I really like that framing of it because um, it it takes the burden on, or the the your attention off of the the vehicle or the use case towards the end goal and the vision and the um, what as you said is going on in every other industry. You know, I, I like the example of um, you can be in China and use an ATM mm -hmm. and somehow seamlessly and, and within seconds, I would imagine, they're settling up who, what banks transfer and what money to whom. So, um, you know, can we get um, even close to something like that or take the steps towards something like that? So yeah, I think all of us see the future. I mean, everyone in this room has a cell phone that they can pull out and use apps and get real time information. I think all of us vision that pretty easily. It's just what's the map and the yep. journey to get there. Yeah. And, and that um, makes me think that I think you all have done a great job of um, speaking candidly and openly about that map. Not, uh, hey, all of a sudden, you know, in a couple of years, you got to figure this out. You're talking about why we want to get there, as you just said, um, what it's going to look like, what it's going to take, how we're going to work together to get there. All of that, that clarity has been, I think, very helpful and valuable. I know for NCQA, but I assume for the market as well. So. I'm sure people want more details. Sure. And quite honestly, we wish we could provide them. We work very closely with ONC, and we're trying to help map out this roadmap together. We have to align certification requirements and regulatory requirements. And quite honestly, the fact that there are certain parts of the healthcare industry that are much more advanced and ready to do this than others who were perhaps left behind in meaningful use. Think about post-acute care or mental health facilities. So we know that this will be a journey, and we don't have specific timelines quite yet, but we're getting there, and we are moving forward with it every year. Yeah, it's helpful. And um, for those who weren't able to join uh, the session that was about NCQA's digital community, we're getting there uh, and being able to provide more of a roadmap, more of a just a framework for these are the stages of transition. And we don't have dates yet either because um, uh, we don't want to imagine it's our job to impose those. We have to work with the, the whole market to uh, figure out how we get there and when. But um, those kind of guideposts hopefully are helpful for our customers as well. Um, so in the journey, um, you have had some struggles, as we all will. I'm thinking about the ECQMs in the ACO program uh, when it comes to all payer data. Um, you rolled out a new um, MSSP reporting program to help with some of those challenges. Um, can you talk about what the changes were and why you think it's going to uh, well, speed the path a bit? That's an interim program. Ultimately, we do want ACOs to be able to report their data by electronic clinical quality measures, but we recognize there were challenges in data aggregation. There were challenges that ACOs have using disparate electronic medical record systems. And so in order to make it easier in this transition for ACOs, as you pointed out, we did create an alternative pathway of reporting. One of the other things that helped with is reporting really just for that ACO population as opposed to the entire population. That was a bit of a sticking point. But that is a transitional program, and our deadline still stands of reporting ECQMs mm -hmm. for ACOs. Yeah, so that's uh, pragmatism and willpower married, right? Together. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it's not always one or the you, other. You may not believe me, but we really try hard not to be unrealistic and not to, to ask for things that aren't just aren't possible to do. Um, you know, and so we delayed the implementation of some of the ECQMs and really worked very hard with the ACO community. NACOS in particular was very valuable in providing feedback and in charting a path forward. I believe you completely, because uh, I think I've seen you uh, demonstrate that. Um, uh, 
We've had uh, a few rounds of rulemaking and engagement, in USCDI, USCDI Plus for quality, where it really feels like CMS and ONC and um, the CDC are coming together in, not to say you weren't partnering before, but it feels like things are, are gelling. There's, um, there's, there's some uh, new energy behind the partnership. Um, are you seeing this? And, and probably more importantly, um, where else do we need to uh, find those partnerships and alliances and uh, cooperation? Oh, I definitely see it. There's definitely more partnership and alignment across really the federal space, I'll call it that. Um, and it includes partnership with VA, ONC. We're trying really hard. You know, you can see when ONC puts out a rule, CMS frequently puts out a similar concomitant rule. So we try very hard to be aligning there. And frankly, I think we need more and more of that. We need alignment so that we're reducing burden and confusion, but we need alignment again so that we're, we're really all in this together. We're all trying to drive towards better quality. More and more alignment across really all payers and everyone in this ecosystem, which is why, honestly, I think what NCQA is doing with Levitt Partners and this new um, initiative around quality and digital innovation, I think is so important to work out the kinks of being able to do this, but together with everybody sitting at the table and really being able to weigh in and work through solutions in a collaborative and collegial way. We're, we're very supportive, we're very excited. That's I great. think more of this needs to happen. CMS, quite honestly, as big as we are, we can't do it alone. Other organizations can't do it alone. We have to do this in partnership and we have to stay aligned. I think one of the biggest lessons learned from quality measures was they went in multiple different directions, depending on who was using the measure, depending on who wanted what out of a measure. We can't do that. We can't create confusion. We have to use the same standards. We have to stay aligned so that we can make it easier and more meaningful for everybody so that systems aren't building multiple ways of doing something or multiple ways of reporting data. So this, this concept of alignment in a public-private partnership, I think, is fundamental. Great, great. Um, I want to note, we probably have about eight minutes left. Um, we are going to try and keep some time for questions. So if you have them, there are mics in the uh, aisleways here. Uh, please come up to the mic. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'm going to go off the cuff again. Um, <laughs> so uh, what? Are oh, he's your, gearing up for it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm winding up here. Uh, what, I think this will be easy enough, and I know there are some restrictions on what you can and can't talk about as far as CMS's future activities. What are your priorities? What are the agency's priorities, say, for the next year, for 2024? Well, you started with the most important agency priority, and that's equity, right? And as many of you have seen in rule writing and really with everything that CMS, HHS, the Biden administration writ large is doing is around equity. This year, over the past several years, as you know, CM has introduced multiple measures around equity, the social drivers of health assessments, the, and this year the rewarding excellent care for underserved populations, which I have to put a plug in, just got published in JAMA this week. Yes, please um, check it out. Where we are changing our scoring methodologies to provide incentives in real dollars to those organizations who are doing a good job in taking care of underserved populations. So equity, I think, clearly has to be at the top of that. Safety, very important. Many of you may have seen the uh, PCAS, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, their report on safety calling for a recommitment to safety because we saw during the COVID pandemic that many of the gains that we had made in safety kind of took a bit of a nosedive, and we need to rebuild that, and resiliency needing to rebuild that as well. There's always a fundamental commitment to quality, and so what does that mean? That means better outcomes, right? That means the engagement and always hearing the voice of the patient and the caregiver, either through patient-reported outcomes or just ensuring that we always have processes in place for the voice of the patient. And then I think I touched on most of the rest of them. 
but it is a multi-pronged strategy. Many of you, I hope, are familiar with the CMS National Quality Strategy, which has eight specific goals. I've outlined many of them here, but that is the direction. First and foremost, it is around the centeredness of the patient in ensuring their voice is heard and that everybody, every individual, can achieve their optimal health. That's great. Um, when I hear that patient-centeredness, I, I do think of some of the work we're doing around um, patient-centered, patient-reported, patient-dictated measures. Um, have you, it feels that, as, you, as one would imagine, it's, um, it's difficult, right? Because uh, if nothing else, how do you, how do you code, how do you, how do you take meaningful feedback from those measures and standardize it to the degree that you can when the whole idea is that it's not standardized, right? It's, it's patient-centered. So um, have, have you seen progress there? Are you optimistic that we're signs of, of hope uh, in that direction? Well, let me put it to you this way. I don't think we're yet on the cusp of a breakthrough because there are challenges. There's challenges as to what do you do with narrative text data. I know there's obviously natural language processing and that may hold some hope. There's challenges with bombarding patients with survey after survey with 50 questions, you know, 30 days after they're released from a facility. There's challenges to asking the right questions and how do you ask them. But I will say I'm optimistic because I think a number of people are coming to the table to work on this, NCQA being one of them. Certainly across CMS and with CMMI, the, uh, you know, the Innovation uh, Center. Um, many of the commercial payers are very interested in this. So I see a, a coming together of people to try and solve this challenge because we do recognize that capturing the voice of the patient in a way that a, is meaningful to the clinician that they can actually see and incorporate it into um, decision making, that, that patients do feel heard and that their voice counts. It, it's just, it's very critical. And so, again, I think the hope is in people coming together, again, in partnership to work through these challenges because it, it truly has been very challenging. Yeah, yeah, understandably. I'm going to make one last plug. If folks, we have about three minutes left. If anyone wants to ask a question, um, if not, I'll keep this going with a question about um, a simil similarly challenging area, which is behavioral health and quality. Um, we've had a couple meetings recently on the public policy side with states and, and others. Um, and what we hear, won't surprise you, is Yes, we, we need to measure the quality of behavioral health care. However, what do we do with that when we can't even uh, get enough providers in the door? It's not that they will or want to provide subpar care, but they need every, everybody on deck. Um, and so it's a, it's a challenge in that sense, but it's also challenging to measure in the first place, even if we were in a position to, um, to sort through that. So. Um, your observations on behavioral health, I assume you're seeing the, the shortage that everyone's no talking question. about. No question. You're absolutely correct about that. Mental health is such an important area that probably hasn't gotten its due for a long period of time, either in funding or in coordination. The administration is really trying hard to remedy that. There are many cross HHS initiatives for behavioral health. We're actually very pleased because we recently introduced a new patient experience measure for inpatient psychiatry. There hadn't been one, and so we're very optimistic about that. But it does have challenges. When do you do the survey? Do you do the survey while somebody is still in the facility or after they've left? Do you allow a caregiver to, to actually do the report? So it does have challenges. And reporting in general in mental health is a challenge. But um, I think we've made a lot, we have made progress. Very pleased about a new patient reported uh, experience and outcome measure in inpatient psychiatry. Um, there is work that is ongoing across the federal government to develop a measure of behavioral health integration, so primary care and behavioral health integration, so that there's more 
care coordination. I think you may see some of that in the you know next several years. Um, and it, it's obviously an important topic. There are key clinical areas, behavioral health being one, nursing home safety being another, maternal safety being another. There are key clinical areas that there are many initiatives that, that are being worked on. Uh, and I look forward, actually, to the progress in, in each of those. We are starting to see that in, in many areas. Great, great to hear. Well. Um, please join me in thanking Dr. Michelle Shriver uh, for her work and for her comments today and her insights.